All right, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host. Thanks very much for taking the time to tune in to this car review that I have of a 2023 Mercedes-Benz EQB. This happens to be the 350 plus trim of their midsize all-electric SUV. First off, I want to start by saying thank you to Mercedes-Benz Canada for allowing me the use of this press vehicle for a few days. Always a pleasure to get uh, vehicles from them and always excited to be driving a Mercedes. So sit back, relax, hopefully enjoy this uh, fairly quick review on a what I feel is a pretty good spec trim midsize level SUV for in this model. Let me get right into it. Now I'm going to this is probably going to be one of my shorter reviews because there's a, really not a whole lot to say about this vehicle other than it's functional and it works really well in doing what it does. And it's something that we already see on the road. Because from a design language, Mercedes taken their already existing GLB platform and they've electrified it. So this is not a ground up uh, designed uh, EV with its own architecture and platform. This is another platform that's been put some batteries and electric motors and electronics to make it all electric, which is okay because it works in most cases. In this case, it works as well. You know, you'll see a small little hump in the back seat because it's taking that existing GLB chassis and electrifying it as I said. So from a design language perspective, as you're seeing by the pictures, it looks just like a JLB basically. And it's got that boxy upright position, uh, midsize SUV that works for Mercedes. You know, it's not too big, it's not too small. It's a good comfortable size. I could park this in my garage at home quite easily with room to spare. Uh, so that says something about the vehicles because that's always a bit of a test for me is to try to see if I can get two cars in my home garage. In this one I can, and I can still uh, charge it as well, stretching my power cord to the other side of the vehicle. So it works. What you'll see is a difference is the front black plastic panel covers where we would normally see a grill and some other visual cues to, you know, blue highlights and EQ badging and this kind of stuff, just to show that it's electrified. But I haven't really not got many looks on this vehicle I've been driving around because it blends in to what's already out there from Mercedes-Benz. And I think the reasoning for this design in keeping with what they already have is because Mercedes is trying to transition their, uh, their brand loyal customers that drive ICE vehicles today into all electrification. And this model I think does it quite well. It's not a big, hey, I'm an EV screaming environment like the EQS is, right? It's a different environment. It's a totally different vehicle from the S series uh, ICE car when you look at Mercedes. So this doesn't scream that. This screams, hey, or just, this just states I'm one of the same, don't, you know, don't look at me. I don't look too uh, unordinary. I look very ordinary. Oh, but by the way, I'm better because I'm fully electrified. So I think that that's a good tactic for Mercedes to get their customers that purchase these type of size vehicles and for their needs into all electrification. Now, this vehicle is available in three different trims in the U.S. We have a 200, we have the uh, we have 250 plus, the 300 and the 350 plus, and there's different configurations of front wheel drive and all wheel drive versions of that. So you can check your local listings to see what's available in your regions. Now they start at a charge. If you look at the battery here, the batteries are 66.5 kilowatt hour in size across the board for the, for the model. So a decent battery size. Again, they're located under the floor. Between the axles, there is a little bit that's taken up uh, around the rear cargo area, and hence the rear cargo is a little smaller than the normal ICE vehicle because of the battery packs, but that's there. But ranges on these for the 250 plus are 250 miles or 402 kilometers. Uh, for the 300, it's 242 miles, uh, 389 miles, and that's for the all wheel drive version. 300 takes it up to 225 horsepower, and then the 350 gives you 288 horsepower with a range of 227 miles or 365 kilometers. So a decent amount of range, not earth shattering. You know, we're seeing these 300 mile, 480, 500 kilometer vehicles now. So this certainly doesn't get that high, but I think where the target market that Mercedes is going after this is for predominantly users and owners that have these today that are doing a lot of urban or inner city uh, trips every day, taking kids to, to different uh, elements, to school, to different events, stuff like that, going back and forth to work, doing grocery runs, this kind of stuff. I believe that that's kind of their prime target market. Not to say you can't road trip in this because you can. Uh, it does support 9.6 kilowatt 
of, uh, of charging at home and up to 100 kilowatt for DC fast charging. So not super fast, but it would be enough to get you through um, you know what they're saying in about a 30 minute stop to get from 20 to 80 percent kind of thing and 30 minutes is a, a very acceptable level by most people now because it has a little bit less range the reality is on the highway you're probably going to be driving for about two and a half to three hours stop for 20 minutes to 30 minutes and then rinse and repeat that type of road trip experience until you get to your destination if you're okay with that then this is a great vehicle because it's it, it's a very pleasant and, and a nice vehicle to drive and it gives you a very sense serene type of driving experience because there's no frills really with this it does what it does very well so with all that horsepower and everything that i talked about zero to 60 is in the 350 model is about 5.4 seconds so it's not earth shattering but certainly for a vehicle of this type this size and weight it's more than enough to get you up and going, folks. You don't need three, three seconds, zero to 60, trust me, to get merging with highway traffic. So this is very capable as an all-around driver. All right, so on this EQ, you can actually pop the, the hood. I thought you couldn't, so uh, I just popped it here, and it's on strut. So again, not a whole lot to see. No front storage. You've got your motor, your inverter. Uh, all that kind of electronics, uh, coolant system, all that stuff for it. So nothing really to store anything. Everything is here. You would fill up your windshield washer fluid over here, but that's about it. So this is one of the ones that you can get into, which is unlike some of the other EQ, especially the EQS line where they don't let you open it. This one you can and do some basic servicing yourself. Now I'm going to talk about the interior in a bit and show you just some quick B-roll and some shots about that. Again, it's a very comfortable interior and Mercedes has done a good, a good job to continue that comfort in the class of vehicle that it is. Just give you a quick uh, tour of the interior. So you have some nice, again, you have your seat controls on the door for power movements, all your standard features, even your trunk opening is on the door. It's got a pretty nice stereo system or Burmeister system. It's okay, you know, it's, uh, I, there's definitely better. Uh, so you've got some, most of your controls for the seats are here, but there's some um, a little bit here uh, for your lumbar support here. Get into the vehicle. We've got, uh, okay, just kind of the one long display here. Uh, if I start that up, hopefully the music won't play. Then we have our typical uh, driver binnacle. Yes, thank you. We, we have our driver binnacle and um, with different stats. Uh, so you can change the displays through some of the mode buttons and stuff. I'm not going to go through all that. Then you have your basically your MBUX infotainment system here with different stuff. I mentioned the trackpad down here, which is where you can use the swipe and um, select different things. It's very sensitive, even dulling the sensitivity. It's still kind of slow, kind of hard sometimes, but uh, it is what it is. A lot of different things you can do, but nothing too earth shattering. It's an okay system. I wouldn't say it's great. Uh, it's certainly not as futuristic as the EQS series are with the EQS sedan and the SUV and then the AMG version of those of the uh, of those as well. Uh, but it's adequate. It does the job. Again, Mercedes is just trying to get people that are used to the GLB into this and at knowing everything and, and, and it's a comfortable environment. You've got your nice stock up here for shifting. Very easy wiper controls and so forth. I like these kind of retro air vents. They look pretty cool and they're very functional. Uh, in directing the air. I like that it has buttons for climate control and also soft touch. So you would bring up, let's say your climate control menu, and then you would adjust uh, settings here as far as fan, about, as far as flow goes, unless you want maximum defrost uh, and seat heaters and seat coolers. Seat heaters are in the door, seat coolers are here. Uh, so you have to search a little bit. So it's a little cumbersome sometimes to get through all the stuff, but it works. Um, different settings for the seats. Down here, I've got a bunch of junk, but certainly have my uh have some storage for your there's a charger for your phone a um, couple of cup holders and then again this thing i think this all could go away personally i think they could do some buttons and then maybe put another little storage thing or something this is to rest your hand and to use this track pod track pad again i'm not a big fan of that but that's the way they do it and then a pretty nice center console bin some decent storage with a couple of usb plugs for charging and for powering you've got your standard glove box which is actually a pretty big size probably put a small pizza in there if you wanted to uh, and that's it. So I got some map lights up here, good rear view mirror, your vanities with some lights up here that come on, standard fare. 
uh, good LED lights, and then this really nice panoramic roof. It's a two-piece roof here in this setup, at, and it has shades that will cover it, um, and I believe the roof may open as well. I haven't tried it because it's been kind of cool. Decent size cup holders. Uh, my water bottle will uh, hold quite nicely in the doors there. I've got a pretty full-size water bottle. So all in all, uh, very comfortable. This might have some upgrades in the seating uh, with the, the leather as opposed to cloth, but a nice, easy environment and nothing too strenuous for people to understand. And moving on to the back seat here, of course, we have uh, similar features. So a good back seat. I've got it pushed back as far as it'll go, and I've got that third row folded down to give maximum space. So good, a good amount of space. Got some map holders, and you've got some vent controls here, and it looks like uh, one thing I did like is you got a 115 power volt back here. Pretty good. It's not a three prong, so it's not grounded, but you, but you do get the two. And you've got a couple USB ports for charging as well back here. So that's nice. A little cubby to put uh, maybe some bubble gum or something in here. And then again, rinse and repeat. You've got a center armrest with a typical BMW German-ish cup holders that will break maybe over time from what I hear. But we'll have to wait and see. I do like the fit and finish, of course. The quality is there. I like some of the touches. In the materials here, we've got some chrome and some other types of things going on, carbon fiberish in some places. So it looks nice, very nice, um, uh, solid interior, solid, well built, and uh, again, very nice for four people, five in a pinch. But wouldn't think of now, as you folks know, I always like to try to get in, in, into the back seat. So let me do that. Um, it's got pretty good doors; they're not 90 degrees, but they open quite nicely. And this vehicle's pretty easy to get in. Don't really have to duck too much; just a little bit there. And once you're in, it is a nice, comfortable environment. A good amount of leg room. I have the seat where I where I would normally have it. Because I like to sit high, I could put my feet well underneath the seat and still have a fistful of headroom here, even with the double panoramic roof that this thing has. Again, five people, I think, would be a pinch. Four is very comfortable. It's a nice environment, pretty quiet, good ample space. Now, let's talk about this rear seat here. All right, so let me show you how to get in these rear seats again. I have, I have figured it out. So you pull the red button and tether, and that comes up. There's a headrest here that pops up. If you do, if you're going to want to use those, now I'll take you around on the other side and show you how to get in. All right, so now that I've got the uh, rear third row up, this is, I did figure out how to get into it. So there's two ways. There's a latch here to fold the seat down, and that's what that does, folds the seat flat. But if you want to get into the back row, you use the, uh, there's a button at the top of the seat here, and you use that. Oh, I have to have the middle piece up too. So you use that, and it actually moves and slides everything forward so it gives you about at best case about a foot of space to climb in here so this is going to be an exercise almost in futility folks there we go as i get into this back seat and all my mass that i have on me and try to sit here so yeah got enough headroom I'm sure if I put this seat back, it's going to be fairly squishy because this is, it comes back to here to lock in. So I've got a fist and leg room. My legs are really up high. Um, it would work in a pinch, again, if I needed to put a couple people back here for a very short amount of time, but for a long-term run, boy, I don't think I'd want to be back here. It's pretty small back here, but it would work. So I'm 5'7", 200 plus pounds. I won't tell you my weight um, because I know it's too much, but I can fit barely, so uh, it will work. And then again, to get out of here, you just lift that and push that forward and climb out over, which I will do off camera because it's a big effort. But anyway, that's show, showing you the versatility of the third row. Should you choose, you want to use it. In the back here, it's got a pretty sizable boot. If I open this up with a power lift gate, with the uh, second row up, so just for behind the second row, you've got about 22 feet of car, uh, cubic feet of cargo space. That's about 623 liters. Um, put that uh, second row down and flatten it out all the way. You get um, 62 cubic feet or 1,735 liters. So as you can see, with these with these uh, third row seats up, this is it. I have a snow brush in here, so about maybe about one foot of space here between where the hatch is and these seats, and then even less when you get to the top. So it's a it's a very small kind of triangle of space that you could put in here. There is a small cubby here for uh, some of the uh, stuff that Mercedes brings with this vehicle, a first aid kit, a little tire pump, that kind of stuff. Yeah, this vehicle, but I will but say right off the start. 
I don't think it's worth spending money on the third row. It's an extremely small setup. You take away a lot of cargo space. It leaves you with just a little bit of cargo space at the back there. And the seats are extremely small and I would say uncomfortable for most situations. You would have to determine that on your own though. If you have some kids you want to put back there, maybe some kid seats or something, you'd have to go and look at this vehicle, take your car seat or whatever, and try to put it in there and see how it works for you. Or see if your kids can fit or whatever you're planning on putting into that seat will fit. It is very small and in my opinion, I don't think Mercedes shouldn't even have bothered to add a third row option to this. You spend some money with for something really I don't think is that useful. Um, but they've done it to say that they have an, an, another SUV that has three rows because again that seems to be the trend now. People are getting excited about three row EVs. Um, you know I just tweeted some information out a little while ago about the new EV9, big, big three row EV and, and you know that's what they talked a lot about. That seems to be excitement. Doesn't excite me because I don't need anything that big but so I guess it's a bit of a marketing, a bit of a like, checkbox, you know, that they can say having a third row. But the reality is, I don't think it's very practical, but you're the one that would have to determine that. Um, <clears throat> so if you're interested, excuse me, look at it, talk to your Mercedes dealer, try to have a, get a sense of size and if it works. But I don't think it's personally worth spending the extra money for it. But other than that, not a whole lot going on here. So um, again, I go back to my point how functional is this third row in the reality for transporting people i don't think it really is that functional you give up a ton of cargo space you have virtually nothing here a couple of small bags would be it uh, you've got some hangers but that's that's it so again it wouldn't be worth the time to do that but if there was a need and a use case and you needed it for a reason maybe put a pet carrier back there and strap it down maybe i don't know something you'd have to go and look at all right, so now that I've uh, poked a prod at the car and showed you to it, uh, everything that's around it, let me take you for a short drive and give you my thoughts there. Just a quick summary of my driving thoughts here in the uh, EQB um, as I uh, go back to return this vehicle shortly. Um, it's very been a very pleasant vehicle to drive. Um, good suspension, good handling. You know, it is a mid-size SUV. It's not a race car, so it's not supposed to handle like one. It's got good speed. I've been running it in eco mode to try to maximize my range just to see what I can get, and I'll talk about that. But as far as driving characteristics, very comfortable seats. You can see I'm hitting over some bumps here, but it's handling it quite well, softening those bumps. So you will feel them, but it's not too jostling or a very aggressive in the spring rate or anything like that. It is a nice, comfortable ride. I've had some people in this vehicle and they've been very pleased with it. Um, seating position, it's comfortable. It's lots of adjustability, so you could find a seat, a position, and, and I have quite high, so if you're taller, like my buddy was, um, uh, that I recently drove a vehicle with, uh, you could lower the seat and find a better position, find a more comfortable position for tall people. Lots of leg room, good width, you know, longer than, than I can stretch. I can't touch the other side, so it's a good width. It's good four passenger, five passenger, if you really need to for a period of time vehicle. Um, in, in those characteristics. Um, acceleration's good, you know, this is the all-wheel drive version, so it's gonna have the top PEP spec and the top uh, horsepower and torque ratings, of course, so it'll get you up and going. I found I don't need to, I can run it in chill mode or their, their eco mode all the time, and I have plenty of power to get up and going. And you do need to kind of, you know, ex press the accelerator much harder. Now, one thing it doesn't have is one pedal driving, so I do have to, right now I've taken my foot off the the accelerator and I'm just kind of coasting and in the last couple of feet I press the brake pedal to stop and I have to keep my foot on the brake pedal to hold the stop position. There is no one pedal drive, there is no hold function on these. So for people that are used to that they might be disappointed. If somebody knows how where to find it in here and set it because I couldn't find it, please put it in the comments. I would love for people to know. Doesn't mean that it's not a good EV, it just means that they want Mercedes wants the driving experience to basically mimic what it is in the internal combustion vehicle experience. Obviously with less noise, better handling, um, and all those features and functions and, and benefits that, uh, that all electric transportation give you versus internal combustion. And I think that's a smart strategy because um, what they're trying to do is convert buyers that might be looking at the internal combustion to say, hey, come over to the all electric version of the GLB, because that's what this is basically, a GLB platform electrified, and you really won't have any problem in learning how to drive and how to operate this vehicle in a short matter of time. 
and I think that's what they're what, what they're succeeding in doing with this platform and with this, this particular model is making it easy. It's not like the EQS where you have all these big menu screens and lots of things to distract you, lots of high tech features, which are nice for the people that want those. And for the higher end luxury sedans, that's kind of what you expect to get, right? The BMW i7 I had had tons of tech, I had the TV that folded from the roof, all kinds of stuff, right? But this is a, a mid-size practical SUV that's designed for that use case, right? It's designed for all the other mid-size SUVs to carry some people, whether it's kids, families, dogs, pets, whatever, stuff, right, around and uh, go on trips and, and do do whatever. Maybe just a daily driver, you know, for families, that kind of stuff. It's an excellent vehicle for somebody that is loyal and that likes the, the Mercedes brand and wants to stay with that, but wants to go into electrification. This vehicle helps them get there quite easily. And I think um, don't miss that that point. Now, I would like if they had a one pedal option on here that you could turn it on. And this might come with some sort of software update later on. I, I don't know if this vehicle supports over the air updates today. Um, it might only for the nav systems, but they might tweak that later on, or they might op they might offer some some dealer uh, upgrades that you could go in and they can flash the uh, the OS and provide. So that one pedal, they might add it to this later on. We'll have to wait and see. I would like to have that, considering that I'm an EV driver and I'm used to one pedal driving on vehicles. I find it quite pleasantly, but a lot of people don't like it so it's nice to be able to have that choice so i hope they put that choice in here otherwise it drives well handles well it's planted it's quiet we went i went through some rain and some snow and some really high winds yesterday no problems in dealing with this on the highway kept its composure i do find the brakes a little mushy um they work you crank on them they'll certainly stop the vehicle but there is if you're just using them normally they feel a little bit more mushier at the end there and again you always have to use your brakes uh, to do that final stop. So, you know, I leave it on max regen and, uh, and an eco mode so that I can get as much, capture as much energy back and then use the brake pedal. I find there's just a, this bit of a squeak at the end when, the, when it stops, kind of like when the brakes are clamping on, they're making a little bit of just a very quick squeak noise. Uh, it, do it doesn't take away from the experience. It's just, I notice it because it happens every time and these vehicles are quiet. So uh, you kind of hear stuff here. Uh, as far as wind noise, it's very adequate. It's very good at keeping the noise out, well insulated. Obviously, this is a you know a boxy platform, so not going to be the most aerodynamic, uh, but it is going to offer um, you know good noise uh, uh, lessening capabilities. In the high wind, I heard a little bit of wind noise coming uh, that I didn't hear before, but that's understandable. Otherwise, it's a very comfortable, quiet environment. Just turned down my uh, HVAC fan there. Everything is easily accessible. I'm not a big fan of the MBUX infotainment system. It's functional, it works. It doesn't give you all kinds of goodies. It's okay. And I guess, again, I think that Mercedes is trying not to go overboard with this vehicle so that they can make those owners that want to travel that transition from internal combustion to ICE-V as seamless as possible in a vehicle that they feel comfortable in. So I think they've done a good job here. Uh, it drives really nice, handles really nice. Uh, the range is okay. I'll be talking about range numbers coming up and all that kind of stuff. A good functional vehicle uh, in this in this class, and they've done a good job. So uh, let me get back to some more thoughts. All right, so I'm here trying the uh, um, driving assist, the adaptive cruise control and lane keeping, and I have it set to um, the hands-free driving mode. As you can see, you've got the green uh, steering wheel there with the hands, and then it goes red after a while if you don't touch the steering wheel got my set my speed set and it's uh, not touching the steering wheel right now it's keeping the lanes as you can see on the road um, quite nicely a little bit of back and forth but it's very subtle movements that the wheel does uh, we have a nice straight and the nav's going so we have a nice straightaway here you can see it's slowing down up ahead so I'm going to disengage it but uh, a pretty good system just pretty normal that we've seen already from systems that are out there where uh, we need to touch the steering wheel every in this case, it seems like about every 10 seconds uh, from that. Uh, I did notice that it doesn't activate until you're up over 80 kilometers an hour speed. So it's not like autopilot where you can activate it at very low speeds, like uh, I think over 25 or 30 kilometers an hour uh, speeds. So uh, this does need to be, it really is uh, designed for highway assist um, and you know taking some of the stress out of highway driving in lane keeping. 
traffic's here. All right, hope you enjoyed that drive along. Um, just some of the stats as far as the range go. I've only had this car for about three to four days, so I can't really do a ton of driving on it. But by what I've seen, the range that's predicted on here was anywhere from 330 miles, th sorry, 335 kilometers to 311 kilometers. I've had fairly cool temps in the last few days, four degrees down to zero. Today it's plus two right now, uh, starting to slowly warm up today with the sun coming out. So they've been relatively cool temps and to see around 300 kilometers, 320 kilometer range, I think it's pretty good for this vehicle, especially with the EPA ratings that I mentioned. So I believe that you'd be able to get those EPA ranges in the nice summer temperatures, probably exceed them a bit as well in this vehicle. The efficiencies I have seen anywhere from 18 to 26 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. You can convert that into the uh, per miles ratings as well to give you a better idea. So obviously not the best efficiencies. Yesterday in the morning, I, like I said, I got, I got it down to 18 and that's pretty good. I was able to see that. So I could certainly see this coming in in the 18, 17 range when the weathers are nice and you're just normal driving, everyday driving, which I think is pretty good for something of this size that's not that aerodynamic, all that stuff. So I think you can rest assured that the ranges that are being advertised for this are very realistic and just needing to plan your trips around that. Now, if we talk about pricing on these vehicles, from a U.S. perspective, they start at just under $54,000 U.S. and they climb from there depending on the multiple trim models. So you have to check out Mercedes' website for that. Here in Canada, um, they start a little bit lower. The base MSRP on this 350 version is $75,700 Canadian. excuse me. Um, and when the, the that third row, by the way, is a $1,300 Canadian option, so probably about $900 U.S. So again, you, ch you choose that accordingly. These do have the 19 inch uh, wheels, as I mentioned, and there's some options, premium and intelligent drive package to climb the, the price point for this vehicle to $85,500 before your taxes and other stuff here. And again, uh, EPA range on this particular vehicle, 356 kilometers, um, powering all wheel drive at 288 horsepower, 384 pound feet of torque, over just over six seconds, zero to 60, all that kind of stuff. So very, very well equipped. Now there are a slew of safety assist, assist features that come with this. You've got AEB, of course, pedestrian detection, lane departure warning, lane keeping assist, adaptive cruise, lane centering, all that kind of stuff. You can add some more stuff. Uh, I believe the cameras come standard with the, one of the option package that's on here. So you'd have to look at the Mercedes site. The Germans tend to have SKUs for everything, so I'm not gonna go into detail on all the SKUs, uh, but definitely you can load this thing up. Uh, as you saw in my video, I did test out the, the hands-free driving. Uh, which is basically using the adaptive and the lane keeping for a short amount of time on the highway and it works. You just have to grab that steering wheel every 10 seconds or so. Otherwise, it works pretty good. So in conclusion, folks, uh, you know, do I recommend this? Hey, absolutely, right? All electrics are kind of what I, I really try to push hard on people. I do think there's an opportunity for a good plug-in hybrid and I have reviewed some and I will continue to review what I think are decent plug-in hybrid vehicles for the market for those that don't want to make the leap to all electrification. But the reality, folks, is we have really good battery technology now. The motors are solid, the batteries are solid, the charging infrastructure continues to grow, and there's lots more charging now than there was even a short three, four years ago. So I would strongly suggest if you're looking uh, as your next vehicle as, as an EV, to look at an all electric offering first and see if that works for you. And there's a whole slew out there. This offering from Mercedes, I think, is really good. It's for people that want that style, that want that roominess, that want that capability in a not too big vehicle, but want the Mercedes brand, the quality and everything that comes with that. So it is an attractive vehicle overall, even though it's that boxy shape. It does have a nice interior. There's no doubt about that. The cabin is spacious for the four people. Again, it's up to you if you want that third seat or so. And it really does have a good powertrain. It, it's got great acceleration. It'll get you up there in no time at all. Six seconds doesn't sound like a long time, but it's pretty quick, folks, trust me. Uh, you know, for some of the cons I would say on this, I do, again, I'm gonna reiterate, I don't think that third row is, is got a useful factor there. Um, you know, some critics say it's pointless. I don't know about that. I think there's definitely a use case, but you'd have to decide that personally, again, if that's going to work for you. Um, and you do get a bit smaller cargo area because of the electrification of this uh, platform. It takes up some space uh, in the cargo area, which makes it a little higher, and you lose some of that cargo space versus the internal combustion version. Certainly, um, 
I believe, as I've said throughout this review, that Mercedes is making this vehicle to make a transition for their customers much more easily, to get into something that they recognize, that they fit in, that they like, that's a popular uh, brand for Mercedes already in the GLB platform. I think that there, this is a wise decision to fully electrify it without giving it all this bells and whistles and screaming that I'm electrified, doing it very subtle, but doing it very nicely and very adequately. And I think that that's where this uh, EQB uh, makes the, uh, the transitioning um, experience for drivers much more comfortable as they move to electrification. So good job, Mercedes-Benz. When we look at competition in this market, the midsize SUV all-electric is a hot market. And as I mentioned earlier, that third row segment seems to be climbing. <laughs> I don't know why. I guess bigger families, who knows? So you've got a lot of potential co uh, competition in this size, you know, from the BMW iX to the Genesis GV60 might be a, a tad smaller than this. You've got the Lyric, which has a surprising amount of room. The Electrify GV70, which is just coming on the market, and I'll have a review of that vehicle within the next few months, hopefully. Uh, I would say that it's very comparable. This is an X3 GV70 kind of size point to give you a sense of size here. Um, some people compare it to the Rivian RS. I don't. That's such a bigger vehicle. Uh, I wouldn't even compare it to this vehicle, maybe pricing-wise in the U.S., but certainly that you know the the R1S I think starts at 100k uh, Canadian or something so you're you're 20k over already up here so I, and I think they're totally different vehicles it's a much bigger with with a real third row in that much more cargo space so I wouldn't compare but there are instances you know out there that you can shop around and look and compare but I think this is a very solid offering for Mercedes and uh, again I would 100% recommend it so good job on Mercedes and uh, hey you know let me know what you think All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Even this beautiful red cardinal that's been chirping around me has told me time to go, give up the show. I want to take over the uh, trees here. So thanks very much for watching. All the information on, uh, on supporting me, Patreon, and thank you, my Patreon supporters, are coming up in the closing credits, including how to contact me. So uh, stick around. You can check all that information out. But again, appreciate you watching. And until the next episode, everybody stay safe, and I will see you when I see you on the next show. Take care, and bye-bye.